The recent attention to global warming is something new and I think very, very welcome. Uh, most of the attention, as far as I can tell, I mean, it's given in various ways, but a whole lot seems to be given to complex global climate models. This seems to be a kind of focal point, at least in my experience, to uh, awakening the attention of, of people. Uh, that, too, is very welcome. I think that's wonderful. However, I'd like to back up just a little bit from the climate models and all of the policy questions that flow from them and raise a prior question, um, or at least a, a thought which I came across reading the works of a physicist named John Wheeler. And he made this statement. Uh, he said, we make the world by the questions we ask. We make the world by the questions we ask. I guess that's especially true for a physicist, you know, you, if you don't ask about whether quarks exist, you won't find out and so, but I think it's also true for policy and social science. We make the world by the questions we ask. So I want to, I want to consider briefly and ask you to consider with me, what are the questions asked by the climate models and the resulting discussion? And what kind of world are they making? What kind of world do these questions make? And what other questions might we ask that would make other worlds? And could we ask other questions that might make a more tractable world for policy? So that's what I'm considering. Uh, the climate models, as far as I can tell, ask a number of questions. Uh, you can add to this, but the questions that I see coming out of the climate models First of all, whether CO2 emissions will lead to atmospheric concentrations of 450 or 500 parts per million. When will that happen? And will that raise the temperature by two or three degrees Celsius by a certain date? What will be the likely physical consequences in climate and geography? And in what sequence? And according to what probability distributions? And what will be the damages inflicted by such changes, as well as the costs of abating them? And what are the ratios of the present values of the damage costs to the abatement expenditures at various discount rates? And which discount rate should we use? And how likely is it that new information learned while we're constructing the model will invalidate the results? Well. What kind of a world is created by such questions? I worry perhaps a world of such enormous uncertainty and complexity as to stifle policy and to make us just sort of throw up our hands. The scientists will disagree on the answers to just about every one of these empirical questions. So could we back up, at least think about backing up a little bit, and ask a different question that creates a different world. Uh, could we perhaps simply ask, can we systematically continue to emit increasing amounts of CO2 and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere without eventually provoking unacceptable climate consequences? I think scientists will overwhelmingly agree that the answer to that question is no. The basic science has been known for over a hundred years. Svante Arrhenius set it forth. Um, the principle, basic principles and directions of causality are very clear. Um, now true, the rates, sequences, and valuations are uncertain and subject to debate. But as long as we focus on measuring these inherently uncertain empirical consequences, uh, then I think we will overwhelm any consensus to do something now with ditherings about what we might someday do if ever the evidence is sufficiently compelling. I'm afraid that once the evidence really is sufficiently compelling, then our response will also be compelled and that uh, there won't be any room left for policy debate. It'll just be all pretty well settled. Or to make the point more simply, 
if you jump out of an airplane, what you really need, you need a crude parachute a lot more than an accurate altimeter. <laughs> and if you have been so prescient as to take an altimeter along with you, that doesn't hurt anything as long as you don't get so bemused in tracking your fall that you forget to pull the ripcord. <laughs> so what's important is a crude parachute much more uh, than an accurate altimeter. Well, I think that's one question then that I would suggest we think about. Another question we might ask is, what is it that is causing us to systematically emit ever more CO2 into the atmosphere? Well, I think the answer to this question, I think I know the answer. It's not an answer anybody wants to hear very much. Uh, I'll give it anyway. Uh, I think it's the same thing that causes us to emit more and more of all kinds of waste into the biosphere, namely our irrational commitment to exponential growth forever on a finite planet subject to the laws of thermodynamics. It's just ain't going to fit together. Now, if we can overcome, for, if we can get above this growth idolatry, then we might go on to ask further questions, the first one of which I would suggest would be, how can we design and manage a steady state economy, one that respects the limits of the biosphere in all dimensions, including the climate dimension? But I don't find us asking that question. Instead, what I hear is a kind of wrong-headed, growth-bound question, specifically something like this, uh, by how much will we have to increase energy efficiency or carbon efficiency in order to maintain customary growth rates in GDP? That's the question that I usually hear. Well, suppose we get an answer to that question. Say we need to double efficiency in 10 years, and by golly, we actually do it. Uh, so what? Well, then we will just do more of all the things that have become more efficient and therefore cheaper. And we will emit more waste, including greenhouse gases. The famous rebound or Jevons effect after the uh, economist William Stanley Jevons. Uh, a policy of efficiency first does not give us frugality or sustainability second. It makes frugality less necessary. 